Hey, what's going on YouTube? So uh, a little bit different here. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of plug before we record our podcast here. So uh, on our podcast, we do a bunch of exclusive shows that are on podcast only called Tack Tips. And this is one of them. So we're recording this here uh, then to be released at the same time as the podcast with our good buddy Steve Fisher of Sentinel Concepts. So if you guys like shows like this, open up your favorite podcast app, search Practically Tactical, and then there's going to be this show, our regular show, and other shows. So check that out. Um, and of course, shout out all the shows and videos we have with Steve on YouTube and podcast as well. But we're going to kick it off here to our TAC tips. Hey everyone, welcome to Practically Tactical TAC Tips. On this show, we explore the various nuances to shooting and being a responsibly armed citizen by exploring a specific topic in depth. On this episode, we're joined by our good buddy Steve Fisher of Sentinel Concepts, still sporting the fresh shot show, clean shaven look. Uh, that will be ending, yes. uh, I'm sure, shortly. You're on the road the next 847 days uh, out of the year. About that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but before we jump into it here, we have to uh, tell you that our show is sponsored and brought to you by our Patreon supporters, Modern Outfitters, Big Tax Outdoors, Squared Away Customs, ATEI, NF Solutions, Phoenix Ammo, Overwatch Precision, and Tough Products. For more information on sponsors and take advantage of our discount codes, please visit practicallytactical.com. So as I discussed earlier, we're joined by Steve Fisher of Sentinel Concepts. Obviously, go check out uh, sentinelconcepts.com. His whole insane training schedule is listed up on his website. And again, he's all over the United States. Uh, you're here, actually here up here in Wisconsin, Texas, like New Mexico, Minnesota, Everywhere. West Virginia. You're in Maine right yeah. now, uh, Ohio. All over. So uh, you can go check that out, sentinelconcepts.com. But so, Steve, we're doing our concealed carry month here. You'll be on a, a show next week uh, as we talk about. Actually, I'm going to change the subject of that show as well. I'll tell you about that later. But so when we take a look at sites, right, probably something that isn't really that difficult, but maybe a lot of misunderstanding kind of goes along with sites and what we're looking for. So mm -hmm. when you get a handgun, because you have like 457,000 handguns. Uh, when you look at evaluating sites, what is it that you look for in sites to put onto your handgun? And obviously, we're, we're skipping out on red dots on this episode. We have a 30-minute long video going over all that with Jeff uh, and Steve. I'll put in the show notes. But when you look at um, when you look at sites for handguns, primarily defensive handgun, what, what is it that, uh, you know, the basic criteria that needs to be met? For me, what I like personally, and for a lot of shooters, um, visibility. So good visible sights, um, durable, obviously. So what I what I prefer personally, good visibility, durability, adjustability. Th those are my my biggest criteria. Are the sites visible? Are they durable? And do they offer me adjustability? Okay. Those, three, those three are my key components when I look for sites. Well, let's let's break down those three then. So first, let's talk about visibility then. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe we, 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 when you say visibility, um, are you saying that the the you know the front side is just you know glowing or there or uh, you know night sights, fiber optic? Um, when we say visibility, what 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 is it that you mean by that for those that might not understand? Well, and that's exactly it. So options, right? It's all about the options that are out there. Obviously, we have a whole array of sites that are out there. Um, for me, when I go to visibility, it's fibers. I, I like fibers. I use fibers pretty much on 90%, 95% of my pistols. Uh, well, I, I would say 90% because the other big percentage are red dot guns. Um, still have some night sights on a few smaller guns, you know, like my Shield, Glock 42, Glock 43 type guns. Um, and mainly just because they offer a bigger, broader sight for me to pick up easier on the small gun versus the bigger guns, right? Because my grip can often be fouled and stuff like that. We'll talk about that. Um, but for me, visibility. So I prefer fiber optics. And I run, I use a couple different sets of fibers, actually. Um, green for indoors. <laughs> red for outdoors. Um, I have some blue ones that are pretty unique from uh, Combat Precision. Uh, which are pretty awesome. And they also have like an ambery yellowish color that are really, really good. It's not your traditional orangey yellow, but it's a really good yellow color that stands out well. And I, I play with a variety of them. I mean, it's easy to install and uninstall fibers, but I need bright. I, I need clarity. I need bright. I need to have a set of sights that offers me, you know, the contrast between the targets and the background as well. Yeah. 
So for me, that fiber is absolutely unmistakable. Um, while night sights are great for a lot of people, uh, we've proven it time and time again, not only myself, but Aaron Cowan, um, dudes from Crosscheck and Salt, a lot of dudes in the industry, a lot of good, smart guys. And, you know, hey, the, the fact of reality is night sights are relevant 10 to maybe 12% of your day-to-day -day routine, to be realistic about it. So for myself, fibers. If I, you guys will get on here and say, well, yeah, fiber optics, night sights, that does it. If you have a white light, you turn on your, your, your white light, your night sights are either too bright, depending on which technique you're using, and they wash, or they're way too overpowering. Okay, neck index, night sights, way too bright, then you lose target focus. You lose that target, you lose target discrimination, you lose things going on in the background. Um, then you have to switch your lights. It gets interesting, weapon-mounted lights, Lights come on, it's a black notch in post. We've seen that in every low light class pretty much out there. Some guys say, oh, night sights. I'm like, yeah, your night sights are no good. I did this class for Trigicon and showed them all these things. And they went, Ugh. So there's a lot of variables to it, but you have to look at what works best for you, the conditions you're going to be in, the environment you're going to be carrying the gun in. Is it going to be a house gun? Is it going to be your, you know, do you have a separate house gun from your carry gun? Do you have your daily carry guns? So as far as the visibility goes for me, I prefer to have fibers. They, they work best for me. My eyes pick them up incredibly well and fast. Uh, there's a reason they're pretty much on every competition pistol out there. <laughs> yeah. Because they work. Um, I, I can't remember what show it was. This was a while ago, and I think I linked it somewhere. Some U.S. Department police chiefs thing. I think they actually did a study yes. on night sights, and they found that they didn't increase uh, hit percentage at all. They did not. But we have also found in independent testing that, guess what? Fibers have increased hit percentages, at least that and some better accuracy on the ranges. Hmm. So here's, cool. here, here's a question for you then. I, I personally haven't experienced it, um, but I, I've never, a lot of people worries of, of breaking the fiber optic, the, the little you know plastic piece or whatever. Yeah. I've never had one break in a gun. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they do and break or whatever. I've never yeah. had it happen. What, what's, your, what's been your feedback on? Um, early, on early on, fibers were delicate. And it wasn't necessarily the fiber itself, but the way the body housing designs were. The body housings were transmitting, I should say, or whatever the actual word would be. I don't know right at this point in time because I'm fried. But um, reflecting heat, or whatever. Yeah, they're reflecting heat back to the site assembly, which was then in turn melting the connection points of the fibers or weakening them from the heat during rapid strings, continual strings of fire, heating, cooling cycles, stuff like that, which was causing the brittleness. And some of those factors. Um, you know, I've shot fibers for 20 years on my bow. During bow hunting, never broken them. There's a lot of shock, a lot of vibration, dragging them through the woods. Yes, they're protected. They're in housings. Doesn't mean they're completely protected or sealed. And I never had a problem with that when I bow hunted. Guns are a little bit different story. Obviously, had that issue early on with some sites. But a lot of it was the housing design and the way it was actually transmitting the heat back into the fiber that's at least what I, what what the thought and the concept is behind it and the whys um but you know what i've had great luck with dawson i've had great luck with ken's site i have had great luck with combat precision sites um and those are my main three go-tos for fibers okay and then so um that kind of talks about the visibility aspect i i, I would say like i prefer red um yes. i think that is something that people need to try out though everybody's eyes are different um, age, uh, like my sight, especially at night starts to get really, really bad. Yeah. Uh, cause I have, I wear contacts all, all the time. And, uh, so I, I think that's something that you should kind of play with to find out what, what colors work for you, uh, type of thing. I am really actually interested in, in that yellow you were talking about. That yellow is really, really cool. And the dude's sights are actually really robust. They've got great ledges on them. I, I like their sight a lot. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a really good setup. That yellow actually pops really nice. And I think it's a good in the middle ground. And depending on your eyes, everybody else's eyes, how we see things, we know color spectrum wise, like blues, reds, you know, the amber yellows are really the colors that stand out for us. Um, the green is another one, but I, I like that yellow a lot. What about the green in, uh, for indoors? Uh, the green for indoors I have found is much easier on my eyes to use to focus, especially on targets at extended distances. And it has a lot to do with the lights in the range. Okay. Uh, are they running, you know, 
LEDs? Are they running regular, you know, luminescent whatever lights or yeah, the freaking whatever right now? I can't think of their damn names, but the the fluorescent lighting. Um, you know, are they running incandescent lights in different variable you know distances depending on the range? So those things take a key factor in how the wavelength spectrum allows me to see those sites. Um, for me, I have found if they're running a, you know, totally fluorescent, like to most places are a lot of times, uh, the green works really good for me. Some of the LED lightings, the green works really well for me. Um, with regular incandescent type lighting and depending on the type of bulbs and wavelengths, I mean, there's a whole weird science in this stuff. Um, the yellow may work better, but the red blooms too much with those lighting, with the with that lighting conditions indoors a lot of times, or it's not enough depending on the lights. Where the green I have found on indoor ranges is way, way easier for me to use and see. Now, and here's something too for a, a plug for your uh, for your essential handgun class. Um, as if you guys watch the video on the class that we have, I think it's up on Steve's web, main website as well. Uh, where you, where you, where you? I think I'm trying to if I can quote you correctly. Uh, where you live, where you work, and where you play. Looking yeah. at all those containers and zones, mm -hmm. using that to evaluate, uh, which we're going to talk about when you're on the show next time. Um, where you go, where you travel, um, you know, whatever your mission is in life, you know, gear, whatever you're doing and carrying based off of that, as you talk about in your class. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it all matters. All of it matters. Yeah. So let's, let's talk. So we got the vis visibility aspect down. Let's talk about adjustability. Mm -hmm. uh, why, for example, do you like adjustable sites? Well, one is, I shoot on an average 30, 35,000 rounds of handgun ammo a year. That's about where I'm at between teaching, practicing, so on. Um, I don't know what ammo I'm getting from <clears throat> month to month. I may go to a contract class at an agency, um, you know, police department, whatever. They usually support that with the ammunition as part of the deal. Um, I don't know what ammo I'm getting from those guys. I could have my gun zeroed for 147 grain, you know, mag tech or 124 MagTech or s &B, you know, which are generally the ones that I shoot the most of. And I get there and they've got 115 PMC. You know, I could be looking at upwards of 200 feet per second velocity differences, different bullet design, uh, powder charges, the blends, everything. The gun needs to be zeroed to the ammo. And it may be one of those things where I get there and like, hey, you know what? I need to put two, three clicks in to make this thing shoot exactly point of aim, point of impact at 25 yards. For a variety of factors. Um, one is the ammo. Two is a shooter that day. I may have an off day. I, I may be that day where, hey, I'm shooting right or I'm shooting left or I'm shooting high. And those factors could be A, too much caffeine, not enough sleep, injuries, fatigue, <laughs> eye strain, right? All those things come into play. But the other important factor, again, is lighting conditions. Lighting conditions play a big factor in reading your sights. And this comes back from years of high power shooting as well in bullseye shooting. You know, some of the old adages of, hey, light's right, sight's right. You know, if I've got light coming across the gun, specifically left to right or right to left or from directly behind, that all plays a factor in how I'm reading the sights and how my target moves. Because it can change the perception that we see the targets in. And then that falls into your shooting glasses, your prescriptions as well. So it's a big, huge combining factor overall that, hey, while fixed sights are cool, do they hit point of aim, point of impact to your ammo? Most dudes go out and shoot ball ammo. They're happy at 7 to 10 yards. Yay, we're great. Break their arm, pat themselves on the back. Until they realize, Ugh. now my 124 grain spear gold dot or HST 147 whatevers, uh, you know, your rip G2 stupid ammo, whatever it is you're shooting, <laughs> is not. I'm like, oh, well, now I need to hold low or hold high or do something to compensate for that. Not always the best. And we tell this in class to guys, like, the first thing you do when you get a rifle is what? Zero it. So why don't you zero your pistols? Yeah. Because uh, we don't know how we've never been told to, and we just always figure they're zeroed from the factory. What is your point of impact at the factory? A lot of guns today coming out of the factories are 15-yard zeros. Some guns are 20. Some are 25. But what is the hold of your sights? Is it a 6 o'clock hold? Is it a dead-on hold? Is it... Yeah. As, as you know, being in the classes and a lot of classes you've taken, obviously, uh, th there is variables. And those variables are the problem. And, you know, we explain this to guys in class a lot about the variables in that equation. But you have to have a way to adjust your zero. 
and I'm not talking for the guys that are like five, seven yard shooters or gals that are like constantly below left, you know, three feet on a target. Yeah. That, that doesn't count. That's your shooting. You just suck. All right. But for the dudes and dudettes that can shoot that are refined shooters that are shooting at 25, 15 yards, you know, having a coarse windage adjustment on a set of fixed sights where you're tapping it or using a sight pusher to move it. You're not sure how much to move it. You're playing that game back and forth. Not necessarily the best thing for you. Um, so having a good set of adjustable sights on your pistol is mandatory, at least in my book. Um, no, to kind of give you something to back that up. So uh, David Defensive Creations, he just built, uh, or he got a ransom rest and had to build a stand and yes. all this stuff. I don't know if you saw all of his infer information. So when he went out and tested out his ransom rest for handguns, because he zeroes all the handguns uh, that he works on, mm-hmm. and he had one gun, I think he ran, I want to say, five or six different ammo through it. Yes. At, I think it was 20 or 25 yards, I can't recall. Um, and of course his guns grouped amazing, but the ammo, I mean, we're talking literally a four inch difference yes. um, on, on the ammo for, for the same gun. And that's pretty significant when we look at, you yes. know, if, if I, in a defensive situation need to, you know, let's say a headshot, for example, sure. a two to four inch window on where my sights, where I'm putting my sights, where I want the round to go versus where it goes, that can be the difference between stopping a threat and putting it around either a miss or that's not going to stop. Um, and that's some I don't want to really want to gamble on if my life's on the line. Well, exactly. That, and that's important. And it's good you bring that up because four inches out of a ransom rest. Yeah. With what no is human that? factor, no stress, no nothing. Now could equate to eight inches, 10 inches, six inches, whatever it is. And it's not even just in where most guys will be like, oh, it's good enough. It's combat accurate or whatever. You, you know, they want to spew realistically it's like no that's not acceptable because not everything is a 24 by 36 piece of paper just standing there in the range looking at you things happen it's moving it's dark it's low light conditions it's rainy it's miserable you're tired whatever the case is and that target could be turning profile to you and give you that five inch window between the chest and the 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 back and the armpit area that's only a four to five inch window and that's why it's important to have adjustable sights because you don't know what you're going to get presented with. It could be a face shot, it could be a profile head shot, it could be a profile body shot. It could be you just get a part of that dude. That dude may just give you a leg sticking out from somewhere that you have to start at and work your way around to finish that problem. So guys who accept that mediocrity of being, well, it's good enough because, you know, I know it's not TV, whatever, but, you know, like, hey, I got an eight-inch pipe play. Cool story, bro. I'd rather have that two-inch dot. Yeah. Big big differences here. That's the entire piece of paper. You, you know, so when people need to understand and they really get to realize this, that adjustables are a priority. So when, you know, I get a brand new Glock in the box, you know, first thing that comes off is the sights. Well, they, they show that, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Mm. And the first thing guys <laughs> do, like, yeah, you know, they're, like, they're going to go out by a set of HDs or cap sights or something or whatever, which are all good sights. But are they good enough for you? You know, I have gotten away completely from night sights other than a couple of my smaller guns. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about that then. On on the smaller guns, for example, like I have a Glock 2 behind me. Sure. Um, and it has Trigicon HDs on it. Um, I haven't felt the need to change them on that gun mm-hmm. uh, because I think it's, when we look at the use of that, that gun has a pretty specific role for me yes. uh, for when I carry it. Um, I don't carry it that often. It has a very specific role. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's the gun that's not like, well, we're going to try to shoot out hundred yards today. <laughs> this, this is what we got. And this is what we got when we got it. And we're just going to make it work. Yeah. Uh, but I, I guess for, for, for me, it's like, you can have terrible sights, but if they're on, they work. It's just, I don't really want to choose crappy sights. I, I don't want to use junk sights. You know, I don't want to use crappy sights. And so for me, like my 42, my 43, my shield, um, some of my other smaller guns, I, I even have a J frame that has a front sight dovetail cut into it with an HD front on it. Hmm. Uh, that we did a bunch of measurements and shot and did all kinds of silly stuff. But so for me, it's because of most likely I'm not going to be able to get my traditional full on master dominant two hand grip like I would on a 34. I'm not going to get that on my 43. So being able to pick up that notch or that sight just a little bit sooner when I have an imperfect grip with that little gun because of my hand size, 
all right, or what it's designed for, which may be a quick draw, one-handed shooting presentations. I want to maximize the ability of that particular gun for me to be able to find a sight sooner or a little bit quicker than I would a traditional two-handed sight picture. You got it. Well, guys, well, oh, if it's good enough for this little gun, it's good enough for this big gun. That's not the point that I'm getting at. The point is the gun has a very specific role. It has a very specific purpose to me. And I just want to maximize the benefits of not being able to establish a full dominant master grip on that pistol when it does have to come out and be used. So for me, having a little bit larger profile sight that's a little bit bigger and brighter on it, most likely that gun isn't going to be as well protected in a holster of some sort. It's going to be in a soft ankle rig. It may be in a soft pocket holster. It may just be thrown in the pants pocket with a utility clip, you know, built in the back of the gun, a clip at clip draw thing, depending on where I'm going with that gun and what I'm doing. And there's times where I do that, or it's going to be in a bag for off body carry. Yes. Off body carry is real and people do it for various reasons. So shut up internet. Um, it's just very fact of life for a lot of places and people. So again, with the smaller gun, I like having a little bit bigger, broader sight on it. Um, it, it just works, I guess, yeah. for, the, for the role of the gun for me. Absolutely. So let's talk about reliability. And I, I think the first part of that would be, or I guess I'll save the, the companies maybe, maybe a second later, but uh, what is it for you when you install sites? I mean, I guess here's, here's, I guess my look at it is if I buy from a reputable company, more than likely it's not going to be an issue at all. Of course, you know, yeah. there's always things that can go exactly. wrong, bad. You can drop a gun, whatever. Um, but Order sites from reliable companies gonna that's gonna solve most of all the reliability issues. Yeah, maybe poning up the 20, 30 bucks to have somebody install it that has the right tools. It's probably also I'd say most majority of issues that I've seen in classes they just weren't installed correctly. Yes, uh, and fall off. Yes, um, you know we run into this from time to time. Um, tolerance of the site cut depends on the cutter that day, how many guns they've already milled on that site. You know, is that dovetail absolutely perfect? We've seen crooked dovetails. We've seen dovetails that are slightly oversized where we have problems with that, um, where the sights are now loose and sloppy and you've got to pin the ends of it or add a bunch of goop red Loctite in there. Um, they, anything could happen. Anybody could have a manufacturing oops. But for the most part, again, you know, I have found across the board, Dawson, Ken site, Heine, um, 10.8s, uh, Combat Precision have all been really good sites across the board nothing wrong with those. There's others that are out there. You, you know, there's a million site manufacturers these days, but those are the ones that are the most popular. You know, Trigicon, um, we have seen issues with some specific site makers with the front paint falling off of the sites. Yeah. You know, okay. that's a whole thing. Or we get, or we get dead tritium tubes. That's yeah. happened. Or they get broke uh, somehow during installation because guys are beating on them with a mallet. I don't know. Um, we've seen it in a couple of like classes where dudes have ejected Glock front sights off their pistols, even Loctite ones. It does happen. Things, things happen. But if you buy from a good, reputable company, they're going to support it quickly. They're going to support it rapidly. They're going to get you new sights out. Um, but the reliability issue, you know, people talk about, you know, adjustables being unreliable. Bullshit. Um, the days of, you know, 1960 era bullseye thin adjustable Smith and Wesson K frame type sites. You know, guys need to remember dudes were gunfighting for years with Smith and Wesson model 19s and, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s with adjustable sights on with K frame adjustable sights and open exposed holsters. You know, that was the, one of the most popular duty guns ever. They all had adjustable sights. Some had fixed. We know that. But man, the adjustable sights were the sights to have. They, they've been around a long time. They've been used for a long time, and they work. Now today, they're just better. They're more robust and they're more reliable. Yeah, well, now we have CNC machines now, and oh, that, amazing! That, and all yeah. that. Um, so, when, when you install sights, do you generally have any sort of, you know, like a round count you like to put through them or take them out and run them real quick? Um, yeah, I, I generally throw them on the gun, get them set, go out, and zero them. Make sure all my windage elevation stuff is correct on my adjustables, even some of my fixed ones. Um, make sure they're hitting point of aim, point of impact for the roll and emission of that gun. Like my little guns, I zero at 10 because that's a roll for me. And I confirm them at 25 to see what the point of aim, point of impact is and differences. So I know for me if I need any tweaks. Um, I'll zero them. You know, if they require Loctite, I'll wait, you know, 12 to 24 hours before I go shoot them. Make sure the Loctite sets up on them just so they're, they're, they're good or the rock set, whatever it is I'm using. Um, 
So then I'll go out, I'll shoot, you know, I'll do a practice session around that gun, you know, two, 300 rounds, uh, 25 yard BH dot torture stuff, mm -hmm. whatever, some, some other drills, just to make sure at least I've got 200 rounds through that gun before I put it in service with those sights. Um, Sometimes I play the bullshit card, and I'm just like, yeah, put them on the gun and throw it in the holster. And I, I know the gun already works, so I'm just going to throw the same. We, we all do that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, let's, let's not kid ourselves, all right? Dudes on the internet, I make sure my guns are, shut up. You put the sights on the gun, you throw it in the holster, like, yep, they're good. I'm, I'm done. Um, but what I will do, if the gun has been, for me, like most of my guns have been used and pre-zeroed and pre-marked and stuff, I will pre-mark the slide with a pencil or, you know, a grease pen or a crayon or something that's high visibility, and I will kick out my old sights, and then I will swing my new sights into those witness marks. I know pretty much that I'm going to be good on my left to right for the most part. It's the up and down I need to fix at that point and check them out. But what I will do is I will put them in my vice on my table, you know, on my bench, and I'll have a target on the wall with the other existing sights that I know are already zeroed, either a small dot or a three-by-five pair of dot, whatever it is on the wall. And I will kind of make those rough clicks just to get it to that same point of impact that was previously. And then I'll try to go shoot. You know, I'm lucky enough backyard and, you know, some tar target stands. I can actually just go out the back door of the basement, you know, and shoot some rounds just to double check it if I need to. But for the most part, go confirm the gun. I mean, there's times I take that stupid chance, like, yeah, whatever. It's in the holster and I go. But setting the guns up properly, making sure you have the right Loctite, you know, not red blue unless the slide dovetail is really off and you need red loctite to keep it secure or a set screw uh, but blue loctite is your friend and the right tools for installing those especially the glock front sights so that's important to me and a sight pusher if you have multiple guns invest in a hundred dollar sight pusher it is worth it to have no i've been thinking about picking one of those up lately it's worth it to get one of the good ones from like uh, MGW or whoever it is off Brownells or whatever it is. They're a hundred some odd bucks. I've got one of the straight and or angled sights. It's not really a huge difference either way. As long as leave me alone, people. As long as they're not twisting in the tail. So for me, those are really handy. And I can throw it in my range bag when I go to the range and make all my little adjustments there as I go. Okay. Um. Well, we're going to keep this episode just to like selecting uh, sites, and we can talk. We'll have to talk about like site picture and red dots and all that stuff later. Uh, but is is there anything that we're missing when when people are sitting here thinking about you know? Because I mean, that's one of the things a lot, especially when you buy a Glock. A lot of people look at upgrading sites. Um, is there anything we did miss, or or anything we did miss, or not covered in regards to selecting sites? Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um. Usability factor, uh, when we talk about that, you know, it's not overly necessary that you have a site with a sharp ledge on it. For oh, that, yeah, that's what I was going to ask too earlier, I forgot. Yeah. So having a site that offers you the ability for one-handed manipulation to be able to catch it on clothing, kit, stuff like that, that's important to me. Um, to a small degree, we know that we can operate sites off-body or off materials that don't necessarily have a big sharp ledge. You just have to apply a little bit more force, a little bit more inertia to the gun itself to make that happen. A uh, good friend of mine, uh, trainer Bill Blowers, has a great video about this um, out that he did a while back on YouTube somewhere. And it's a really good video. Me and Bill had discussed it for a while, but I don't need that ledge, but that ledge makes life easier. And for some people, they, they may not be the big PT powerhouse stud that Blowers is. They, they may not have the overall physical strength that I have to where the ledge helps them. Smaller frame shooters, some women, men, injuries, all those things. So any little advantage I can get helps. And that's why like my even my adjustable sites have that ledge. I make sure I can hook that ledge onto something just to make my life a little bit easier for either one hand malfunction clearances or manipulations of the gun. Even though it's a 1% chance that that could occur, your, your, your odds of being that one-handed Oh my God, reload manipulation, double feed clearance are so slight, about as slight as the chance of you actually getting in a gunfight. Uh, we, we can go through 10,000 shooting videos. I talked to uh, one of the guys uh, from Active Self Protection, John Korea, about this and looking at all the videos. It's like a 0 0.001 chance. It's very minimal that it's actually happened in all the video shootings that he has seen and, and has, which he has tens of thousands of them. So when he compiled that data for a presentation, it was pretty interesting for me to talk to him and read about that. I'm like, well, it's kind of like reloads. 
very, very small. Very excellent chance, yeah. But so I, I like the, I like the ability of the sights to have at least some sort of ledge on for manipulation, not overly sharp. But if it's sharp, just bump it down with a little bit of you know six, seven hundred grit, eight thousand grit paper or whatever, just to dehone those sharp edges a little bit. Don't take a dribble to it. Just <laughs> hit it with a couple passes of paper is all you need to take those really sharp edges off. So uh, part of my adjustable sights and that, and I like a black rear on all my sights. I like having black rear sights uh, because they draw your attention to where it's supposed to be, the front of the gun, not the back of the gun. Uh, the number one problem that we have in class with students and their ability to shoot accurately a lot of times is the fact that they're getting a focal shift between front rear and target because the bright rear sights are drawing their attention because it's closer to the body. And that's where, honestly, you know, the black Sharpie comes out and the black sight, the, the sights get blackened out, like the high vis true glow type sights. They, yeah, they are, they, they are like the headache of my existence in class. And I know right away what the problem is. If you go to the guy, hey, look, I'm going to use this on here or a piece of tape. You can take it off later. I don't care. But just trust me on this for a couple of the relays. And they're like, wow, that's a huge game changer. Black sights are the key. Black rears win. Uh, amazing point right there. Um, I hate three dot sights. They're stupid. I try to align three circles in a row for for. Uh, it's thank the, you. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. We seek out symmetry. The human eye seeks out ninety degree angles and symmetry. And if you don't have that, so now you have these four to six right angles on a sight picture, and then you have these dots, and then you're trying to get these dots all perfect with these horizontal and vertical lines. It's like giving a kid one of those little big, you know, those little play block balls with all the shapes on them. And they go, eh. And they're trying to jam the round peg into the pentagon shaped hole. And we look for certain things. And it's the same thing even when we get outdoors and even in a hunting environment, we see certain shapes that our eyes naturally pick up on. And those are 90 degrees. Those are right angles. Those are horizontal and vertical lines. Don't throw circles into the mix. It's stupid. Um, one particular company, uh, Springfield actually I've had a couple of their pistols come in and one or two that I bought they've got two dot rear whites with a fiber optic orange up front and nothing lines up with that assembly that's how my night came yeah and I remember that actually now I was like we are like yeah get rid of these pick them out throw them in they even had the wrong they even had the wrong height rear sight so yes they had the wrong height rear sights it's like you get the assembled gun with all the mix and match pieces, and hey, this is good enough because most everybody shoots at seven to ten yards, anyways, and they'll be fine hitting an eight-inch circle. Yeah, not the case. Um, you know, it's good because I've had certain manufacturers that I have dealt with in my consulting uh, jobs that actually listen to this information, and they're starting to change that, which is good. They're starting to see this, so hopefully, in the next you know next few years, you will start to see the guns coming with more fiber optics and black rears out of the game. Nice. Um, here, here's a follow-up question to you talked about for zero guns, uh, for small guns, you zero at 10 yards, mm -hmm. uh, right, duty, carry, whatever guns, what do you usually zero those at? Uh, 25. 25. All my guns are 25 yards, zero, because I need to know. Um, I have some guns that I've played with in the past year that are zeroed at 50, uh, just because I, I like to play with that stuff. But a 25-yard zero has been the most consistent for me across the board, and it lets me know when I screw up in my shooting. And that's the thing. You don't know where to zero if you can't group at XYZ. The 10 yards is easy. Anybody, yeah. almost anybody can shoot a gun well at 10 yards to figure out a zero on their pistol. And that's a very small percentage. Well, let's, let's, you know, get that down, especially with newer shooters. But more experienced shooters, guys that are more in tune with this, that have been to a lot of the training programs, myself and others, Understand 25 yards is real. Uh, we know that most grocery store aisles in North America, which is an average place we all go to, are range anywhere from 27 to 33 yards from end cap to end cap. So I need to know what my pistol does at the distance. And why not zero it for your maximum capability, your maximum distance and abilities? And then just figure out where it shoots. Because newsflash, it's only an inch or two off at 10 once you've zeroed at 25. And it's not that much of a difference. It's, I mean, it's literally an inch or so off in difference in the height of the board. Yeah. So it's really not that big a deal once you have that maximum point blank zero done with your carry ammo, not your range ball ammo. And this is why it's important to zero your duty ammo, zero your carry ammo, and then go shoot ball ammo. And then figure it out. And hey, if you have a notebook, which you should, you can be like, hey, I'm going to class this week. Uh, I'm confirming my gun. 
you know, and my gun just noted down from the range, hey, it's shooting three inches left and or three inches right and two inches high with 115 ball junk, whatever, you know, bottom feeder ammo versus my 124, 147, you know, gold dot HST ones. Make that note, put two or three clicks on your site, make sure you note it for that class, and then turn around and when class is done, ask the instructor, hey, can I have a minute or two on the range, you know, the class is over to reconfirm my handgun with my duty ammo or my carry ammo. Absolutely, dude. No problem with that in the least bit. Sure, go ahead and make your clicks, do your adjustments. Guy will fall back to his notebook. Yeah, I need to put two right and two and two high now or two low. Um, and they'll take up their screwdriver, make the adjustments on their site or their RMR, confirm their carry ammo. They're happy, good to go. Same thing when I teach LE classes. I make sure the guys read zero from their duty ammo to their training ammo. Um, I had that last year, two years ago, where I was training a team, a SWAT team up uh, from the Midwest. Uh, in the middle of the training cycle, they had a call out. So while they're prepping stuff and getting ready to do this uh, job, one of them, hey, we need to do a quick reconfirm of our duty ammo real fast. And this is why I explain to these guys either A, check what your difference is. If it's two to three inches and we're shooting a 50 yard and in class, like an assaulter's class or something, or just a manipulations class where it's 50 and in, the zero difference between the two is not going to be that huge. For them, especially with five, five, sixes, um, it may be two inches off, two inches low, whatever. Dude, just shoot the ball ammo. Don't change your duty ammo at this point. Don't don't even worry about it. If you want to change it, change it by all means. But at the end of each day, I need you to make sure you go back to those clicks that you dialed in or dialed out of the gun. Like, yeah, absolutely. So that that is part of why adjustable sights are important. Um. So yeah, we covered the ledge. I meant to do that and forgot. Uh, you yeah, about I totally forgot until then. Slide. Um, any other things uh, for considering uh, sites that we may have missed? Maintenance. Oh. Yeah, quick maintenance thing on them. Um, maintaining the sites is important, just like the rest of the gun to a degree. Uh, most of today's adjustable sites are a high-carbon high steel site. They will rust. They will get rust on them. Uh, for me, a little bit of oil and steel wool every now and then just to, just to take some of that uh, – some of that rust off of it or a toothbrush or something, put a little dab of oil on them, rub it in when it's just sitting in the safe or in your lockbox or whatever, just to help keep everything working the way they should. Uh, I have a tendency to dry those off with either a rag or a can of compressed air, you know, at some point before I shoot, just so there's no glare coming off of the oil that's on there, or the extra uh, protectant, uh, depending on what you're using. Uh, maintain the sights, witness mark them like anything else. Make sure none of your screws have shifted. Make sure they're nice and tight. Uh, we see guys that fail to lock tight their set screws or use their set screws properly, and the sights can shift uh, under hard use. Not that often, very rare, but it does happen. So just, just keep a good preventative maintenance check on your sights, be it any gun, carbine, pistol, shotguns, whatever. That's still a very important factor. Anything that gets put on the gun should either be witness marked, lock tighted, or at least have some way to ensure that they have not shifted. So just give them a quick jiggle every now and then, make sure they're set, uh, preventative maintenance, rust issues. The sites will get wore, the black finish will wear off of those sites. I know yours have them, mine have them, a lot of guys have them. That can cause glare. Especially when lighting is directly overhead or coming from the front, that can cause a glare. Uh, a Sharpie works in a pinch, you can get some you know, cold blue or some site blackout, that will work just fine. Some guys I've seen have gone to the whole thing of having to spray paint the site again with like a stove black site, uh, Whatever you use, I don't care. Uh, just make sure you maintain those sights. Check your front fibers. Check your front night sights. Most guys fail to clean their front night sights properly and wonder, well, my night sights are dull. Well, yeah, you've got fouling and carbon on them. Keep a couple of those little alcohol swabs with you. Now, those alcohol wipes will work great for getting rid of the carbon and build up on those and cleaning the sights off real quick, especially up front on your night sights. Or even some of your fibers, because um, you will get carbon buildup, you, you know, dirt in them, stuff like that. Especially if you take a little petty class, they're going to get dirty as hell. That's um, pretty factual. I say, uh, you know, every year or so, I'll usually replace my fiber optic. Just over time, they don't seem to transmit light as well. And throw a new one in, and, you know, it's 10, 20% brighter. Yeah, and, and the, dude, when you buy fiber optic sites, they give you extra fiber. Yeah. So why not take it with you? You can do a preventive maintenance check. Cut the site, replace the site, um, you know, like you do on your batteries and any of your other optics. 
treat it like you would your optics. You know, if you're changing the batteries once a year in your armor or your aim point or your whatever hollow sun strike force, whatever site you've got, which you're probably changing batteries more frequently in some of those than others. But hey, before the training season starts off or before your next whatever, yeah, it doesn't hurt to replace that fiber, go out, shoot it, confirm it again, make sure it's good to go. And yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. then what I'm going to do is take the opportunity then for those that maybe just bought new sites and want to really ring out their gun and, and test out the accuracy. I think you have a couple uh, handgun accuracy classes, don't you? Yeah, we've got uh, several that really, um, there's a lot of guys and a lot of gals out teaching a lot of good programs on this stuff. Um, everybody has a variation of what they see. And what I did with my handgun accuracy class or handgun diagnostic, you know, there's a four hour, eight hour block of this, or, you know, that we cover and we cover it heavily in essential handgun during the first half of the day is understanding what you're doing wrong with the gun and what you've been doing wrong for the past 15, 10, 8, 20 years of your life shooting a pistol. Instead of trying to teach you everything that you need to know to change that after 20 years, you're not going to do that in 4, 8, 16 hours. That requires years of undoing. But I will show you everything you're doing wrong with the gun so you know what is happening and the whys behind it. And that's the key component is understanding what went wrong. It's not what you did right, but it's understanding what you were doing wrong with the gun. And that's the key component of that class. I still remember the from the video of like these little bumpy things on top. If you keep if you can keep those aligned while you while you pull that little trigger, you those rounds are exactly where you want. Yeah. A lot just, of just keep those bumpy things. Just keep those bumpy things, man. That's all you need. <laughs> uh, and truthfully, you know, like we know the whole the whole secret to the whole recipe is all in your grip. Yep. Absolutely. All in grip. Nothing else. Um, but so I'm going to move to wrap this up. So, yep. you know, next time we do one of these, maybe we'll do an understanding your site. So we did the selection now, yeah. now the next time we do understanding. And, and I will mention, I found the uh, one handed wrapping racking with Bill Blower's video. So I'll put that in the show notes as well. For yep. those that want to check that out yep. um, or over on YouTube again, I'll put a link, I'll put a link down below to that. Uh, again, so Steve Fisher, Sentinel concepts, obviously Sentinel concepts.com. A link will be below in the description or in the show notes, obviously check them out and watch all the other videos that we have. And again, for those that are on YouTube, if you like what, if you like this stuff that we're talking about, there's a lot more of them on our mm -hmm. podcast. So all you got to do is open up your favorite podcast app, whether that's an Apple phone, iTunes, or, or, or whatever types of Androids and stuff out there, just download a podcast app, search practically tactical and a bunch of this and more podcasts will be out there for you guys. To listen to. So, Steve, buddy, thanks for coming on uh, while you. You're for your class tomorrow. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you on the show show next week. Absolutely. And, uh, it's going to be an awesome time. So, again, there it is, guys. Our Practically Tactical ta Tack Tips on selecting sites. Uh, and, again, I want to thank Steve for coming on. So, for all of our listeners out there, if you have uh, if you want more information uh, or a topic you want covered, any of that, email me at nick at practicallytactical.com. we we'll be more than happy to check those out and get those discussed for you guys. And, again, I want to thank all of our amazing Patreon supporters for making this show happen. And our sponsors, Modern Outfitters, Big Tech's Outdoors, Squared Away Customs, ATEI, NF Solutions, Phoenix Ammo, Overwatch Precision, and Tough Products. And I should mention, too, Steve, you got new products coming out with Tough Products, right? You got the new Rev Bag, uh, yeah. Too, right? Yeah, we've got the uh, Revelation 2.0 SBR pack designed around the law folder and 10 and 11 and a half inch carbines. That's pretty cool. Or some of the little AR pistols. Um, that's been successful. We've got the Just In Case Tourniquet Carrier, which will fit on packs in vehicles your molly gear, your rifle slings, it'll fit on everything. Um, it's, it's actually probably the, out of everything that I've done with, with those guys, that is one of the most exciting things. As you know, I'm well about that medical life. Um, and yeah, that tourniquet holder is awesome. And we've got some new stuff coming. I'll be there in March, finishing up some redesigns on some new stuff that, that'll be coming out a little bit later on this year, probably Q2. Nice. Well, again, go to practicallytactical.com slash sponsors. And guess what? We have a discount code on Steve's gear for you guys. So take advantage of that. Use the discount code over at toughproducts.com. Again, all of our sponsors, information, links, and discount codes is at practicallytactical.com. Click on sponsors. But there it is, guys. There is our tack tips on selecting sites with Steve Fisher of Sentinel Concepts. Until next time, thanks for listening.